see the title that very night. The events in Daniel's chapter 1 through 4, of course, has to do and pertains to Daniel, but especially also the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who expanded and united the Babylonian Empire. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, pride and arrogance lifted its ugly head, and God got the attention. The, the, the God of heaven got the attention of the king, and he repented. He humbled himself, and God, in his graciousness, restored, returned uh, the king to power and authority. Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 B.C. And one of his last statements or two that he makes is that heaven rules. Amen? Heaven rules. And that all God's ways are, are just. Those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. Amen? Have you ever been there? God is able to humble. But now we have another king in chapter 5, Belshazzar. And not to be confused with Daniel, who had a name close, similar. But this king uh, was really known for his pride and his arrogance. It was great. And there was no repentance. He did not acknowledge the God of heaven. In fact, he uh, performed sacrilege and a slap into, into the face of God. And as we know, God is able to humble him. Amen? God is able to humble Belshazzar. Have you ever heard this phrase before? Well, I, I, left, I forgot that one. The handwriting on the wall. You ever heard? Ever? We use that term. And uh, I think it was Linda who was talking about during our Wednesday uh, class. There are so many statements or sound bites, phrases that we use today that go all the way back to the Bible. Go back maybe 2,000 years or 3,000 or 3,500 years that really have its origin in the Bible. Today, we'll use that phrase in conversation. We'll say something like, I can see the handwriting on the wall, right? Meaning that there is a sign, there is a premonition of some type of failure or disaster. And of course, this goes right back to the true story of Daniel and Belshazzar. In chapter 5 of Daniel, as we will see, there was literally a supernatural hand that wrote on the wall in the banquet hall of Belshazzar's feast. Belshazzar was involved in indulging in drunken revelry. He was prideful, he was arrogant. And it's interesting because at this time they are surrounded by the Medes and Persians. They can't even get out. But Belshazzar in his pride and arrogance debases the Jewish sacred temple vessels by using them as wine goblets for his friends and for his concubines to drink. And then immediately a disembodied hand, a message from a watcher, an angel sent by God, wrote and we have the handwriting on the wall. And yes, failure and disaster did occur that night. That night. Belshazzar was killed in October 539 B.C. And Babylon was replaced. Uh, was, there was another king who replaced Belshazzar in the kingdom of Babylon. So let's take a look at chapter 5 and go through this, and let's see what we can learn. Let's see what we can take away as we go home today. And again, although surrounded by the Medo-Persian army, we read in Daniel 5 that King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of a thousand. 
Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought into the gold, I'm sorry, then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, <laughs> iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall in the king's palace that opposite the lampstands, that, see the detail? Opposite of the lampstand so that they could see it. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed. You know what I'm saying? He, 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 there's another phrase. You look white as a ghost, yeah. The king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called for his enchanters, the Chaldeans, astrologers, the wise men of Babylon to interpret this writing. And if so, they would be clothed with purple, be given a gold chain around their neck, become the third most important ruler in the kingdom. And of course, none of these magicians and astrologers could give the interpretation. They couldn't even read it. Then the queen, because of the words of his lords, came to the banquet and declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. They were pluralistic in, in their, they believed in many gods. So there is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, Nebuchadnezzar, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in Daniel. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made in chief of the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. Because, well, let's back up here. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret deems, dreams, explain riddles, to solve problems, were found in Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give an interpretation. So Daniel arrives, he speaks, and he says, Oh, most king, a uh, king of the most high. God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory. All people, nations, and languages trembled and feared him. But when his heart was lifted up, his spirit was hardened, and he dealt proudly. He was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of men, and his mind was made like that of a beast. And his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. Until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind. And sets over it whom he will. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart though you knew all this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which you do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from God's presence the hand was sent 
and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene Mene Tek El Parsin. This is the interpretation of the matter, Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tek El, you have, uh, Tek El, you have been weighed in the balance, Vince, and found wanting. Came up short, fallen short. And then Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. In fact, this word Perez actually in the Hebrew just changed the, the uh, vowels and it is the word for Persia. And this is fulfilled prophecy of what Daniel gave to Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of this fantastic, huge uh, idol, this, this, this gold head, the shoulders that, and chest that were silver, which represented the Medo-Persian Empire. But Belshazzar is too confident in himself. He had 10 to 20 years worth of food stored up in their city. They had continual water flow from the Euphrates River, which went right through the city. And in his pride and arrogance, not only did he boast, but he, sacri he performed sacrilegious actions with the very utensils and goblets and cups from the temple of God himself. According to ancient uh, accounts, Belshazzar did not know that the Medes and the Persians would redirect the river and were able that night to go into, through the waterway, under the thick 300-foot walls and reach the palace. Belshazzar and others were slain that night that night in October 539 BC and this is the writing that was inscribed Mene Mene Tech El Parson <coughs> this is the interpretation of the matter Mene God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end Tech El you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And we read, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. The next verse tells us, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom. That very night. You know, sometimes we think that... Uh, God set things in motion and it's just kind of running on its own, it's winding down, whatever, and God's gone somewhere and we're just sort of the luck of the draw, but you know, God is involved in our lives. And sometimes we think he's slow to act, but sometimes he's, he's, he's not, but we know that in the end, on judgment day, we will stand before him under the blood and under the grace of Jesus Christ. And in the, mint, mint, in the meantime, we know that the rain, the rain falls on the just and unjust. Amen? But God is not mocked. And here we see that very night, the kingdom was taken away. Belshazzar died. Pride was the ultimate cause of Belshazzar's downfall, and he knew this. Daniel said, Belshazzar exalted himself against the Lord of heaven. And this reminds me, uh, as we looked at Lucifer last week, the demise of Lucifer in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. When I think about myself, uh, when I think about, you know, I, and I think you do too as Christians, we're saved, right? We've got it. I mean, we're saved by grace through faith. And we're, we're not to presume on it, but we are. And yet how often do we trust in our securities? Power, maybe position, 
prestige, peer approval. I think you see a lot of that on Facebook. Like, don't like, right? Wealth, wisdom, our potential, vain accomplishments, self-esteem. And yet we have this one life to live on the planet as believers. This one life to believe, to serve, to look up continually and remind ourselves that heaven rules. Amen? Heaven rules. And with the time we have left, to pray that one day for our eulogy, that somewhere in that eulogy there will not be a mene, mene. Your life has been measured and a tech L. And you came up short. You came up short in your Christian walk. Even as Christians. Because of our pride. In the New Testament, in Jesus' ministry, Jesus hammered, he hammered on, on the, the scribes, the Pharisees, because of their pride and arrogance and hypocrisy. And he said uh, this to them, a famous verse for us today, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Exalted. And as we see from the scripture in Daniel, who does it? God does it. God is the source. He is the author of it. The performer of it. That's why Nebuchadnezzar in, in Daniel 4.37, when he came to himself, came to his senses, he says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able, meaning he has the power to humble. Had a, a sort of a humbling experience, I think, along with about 200 other ministers. Uh, years ago, we went to Southeast Christian Church for a, a few of us went uh, for training. And uh, Bob Russell, who is an author, is a senior pastor at that time at the church, a large church. Uh, we were sitting on a, on a, a preaching seminar. And again, there's about 200 preachers, 200 ministers there, and, and uh, Bob speaking, and he asked the question. He says, well, just write down on a piece of paper uh, what you think your preaching ability is and label it from 1 to 10, 10 being the highest. So everyone, we wrote down our number, we kind of folded up, held on to it. 1 to 10, 10 being the highest. And then after we wrote that, he said, are you ready? Are you done? We said, yes. And he said, now... He said, take off three. Take off three. So if you had a seven, take it down to a four. If you had a nine, take it down to a six. You know what I'm saying? Because while we are in these bodies and while we have free will, it, there is that choice. We're either going to honor ourselves or we're going to know that heaven rules and honor the God of heaven. That's why in James 4.10, I especially like the New King James Version, this, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Remember, we, we sing that sometimes. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Let's sing it. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up higher and higher. And he will lift you up. Yeah, thank you. That's why we also sing that God is the lifter up of our face. In the olden days, you'd go before a king and you would, you would, just, you would get as close to the ground as you can and, and, and hope and pray for his mercy. And if he gave you mercy, he would lift up your head. And God is the lifter up of our head. He will exalt us. He'll do it. And in this message, I was thinking, uh, 
uh, and I don't usually go in that direction, but I was thinking about Mary, looking about humility. I was thinking about Mary, who she's, she has conceived Jesus. And I, and I got to say this, I think we need to be careful uh, in giving too much homage to Mary, you know, too much attention or you know, deifying her per se, but I do think she deserves some attention and respect for the type of person she was, for her humility. And we have something that's called in Luke chapter 1, the Magnificat, uh, Mary's Song of Praise. When she visited her relative, Elizabeth, who was also bearing a child, was John the Baptist. And let's see what direction Mary goes in her praise. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked upon his humble servant. Let me start this again. For he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who are in awe of him, generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. This is a psalm of David, Psalm 51. O oh Lord, open my lips. Let's back up. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. <clears throat> the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Let's read this together. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. One more time. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Amen.